Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Hollywood Red Carpet Radio Show. My name is Debbie Perkins, and I'm your host, and I have an awesome guest this evening with a friend coming aboard. We have Mr. Doug Bryce. He is a self-taught artist animator. He also ventured in the U.S. Actually, he, he retired from the U.S. Air Force, and he worked within the comic industry and animation industry. He received an honorable discharge. In the 70s, he worked with four color comics, the old school style. And he also has been working out of Chicago. Who doesn't love an artist from Chicago? We love this. And and we know a few, as we do Charles. Um, Charles Morissette is coming to us as well. Um, he is also an incredible animator and we've had him on before and we'll recap with charles but i but i want to welcome our special guest mr doug rice thank you it's good to be here yeah i'm clapping for you thank you so much what a journey you've had and your work and you're still on that wonderful journey but oh, yeah. doug would would you tell me what you were like as a child was art your number one thing? Was it something you picked up at a specific period of time in your life? Um, uh, I am assuming it was before you was in the Air Force. I came from a good family in terms of numbers. I had uh, an older brother and a younger sister at first, and I had a younger brother again later on when I was an adolescent. But I always had a going for me an imagination. My imagination was always getting me in trouble. <laughs> Of course, of course. I, I was I was a scamp. I I was uh, a practical joker. Uh, I was a terrible older brother to my sister, <laughs> and uh, my brother was 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 a model uh, child. He he was really smart and and really uh, together and, and mentally he was always uh, way ahead of the game. Later became a uh, uh, Victorian in high school. And I saluted him in college. So he had the brains. And I was always trying to, I was always expected to keep up with him in terms of school. I never could. <laughs> so Right. Well, you had to be you. Exactly. You couldn't be a carbon copy of another person. And there's always that kid in the family. We, You know, the big families, there's always that kid. So yeah. I understand. I understand having that, having that brother. <laughs> I think I had that brother. <laughs> In, in terms of uh, my classwork as a child, in elementary school especially, I, ha I used to draw in the margins of my uh, books, uh, the paper, uh, homework papers and things, just to keep myself awake. <laughs> and, so you're a doodler. You, you yeah. were just, like when you're on the phone, remember the old phones where they had a cord stuck to the wall and you just doodle as you're talking? Well, I didn't get to use the phone much as a child. They, they, Parents are very strict about that. Um, wow. well, you know, this is the uh, 1950s. So, you know, the kids did not communicate by phone. They went over to the person's house and communicated directly. Uh, they were able to move about and uh, ride their bikes and walk on, walk up and down the street because there weren't people, you know, attacked. Yeah. Uh, exactly. Very, uh, uh, uptight society in that respect. Um, but... Uh, it was, uh, I had a fun childhood. I, I, I regret awesome. that things have gotten such a way that children have become so restricted and so over, over seen as, uh, in uh, terms of how they're raised. And uh, they don't have the freedom that we had uh, when we were young because we could take a bike and ride all over town and oh, uh, sure. wouldn't think nothing of it. Oh, sure. Even when I was growing up, um, I had no problem. Um, walking on the railroad tracks for crying out loud or, you know, and, and being at somebody's house halfway across town, um, like you said, it was a safer time. Yeah. Uh, there was no, there were no gun issues. There were no gang issues. There were certainly no drug issues. So it's like, it was a, a time I yeah. remember with a certain yeah. time, even though there are other things that were totally wrong with society, uh, for children, it was pretty much, uh, Haven. We had TV shows and cartoons and oh wow, 
He had uh, everything going for us. Uh, most of them were in black and white but back in my day, but uh, we still had them. And that was like a, a permanent babysitter. <laughs> and and people really, um, like even with the old Sunday papers and they had the little, you know, they had that one page of the comics. And people would dive on them. I mean, they even went so far as to make Silly Putty so that it could pull a print off, you know, right. onto the Silly Putty. And it was such a major thing. And it was – people couldn't live without reading their comics. And it's been like that for who knows how long, since the beginning of time, if you ask me. But it, mm -hmm. it's – you know, art's been around since – people have been alive you know and it's being able to express a story on a whether it's a rock for in a cave or a piece of paper to express your feelings and emotions i i think it's incredible and how did you go from well you were in the air force yeah. and then and then what? you were discharged but yeah. were you doing anim were you doing uh animation in the Air Force as well? No, the uh, the Air Force doesn't have anything like animation. Uh, they do have the Signal Corps, but I was a, a regular admin specialist. I worked at an office. But I did volunteer for work at the base newspaper in Forbes Air Force Base, Kansas. And so some of my first published work was in the, the, air, the air Base newsletter. That's awesome. Doing editorial cartoons, that kind of thing. That's all awesome, and I bet people love that because it gives their mind a break off the the whole, you know, whatever was happening at the time. Mm -hmm. The Somebody, humdrum of being in the service. Can I thank you for your service? Oh, you may thank you. You're welcome. And we are very honored to have you um, be a part of that. Um, so. Now, you went on to do some four-color comics, and for a lot of the young people listening, could you explain what the old-school style is? Okay, first of all, they use very cheap paper, uh, pulp paper, and uh, they, they kept the cost down of every book. To, uh, when I was a kid, they, comic books cost 10 cents. Woo! What? Yeah, yeah. The cheap process used... Uh, a dot system of, of colors were placed in dots, and uh, there was blue dots and red dots and yellow dots. Sometimes they over they overlapped and it created a, another color, like green or brown. Um, and it was a very cheap process. It was done uh, in Illinois. There was a process, uh, the town in Illinois, that was totally devoted to the four color process of co comic book uh, publications. All the comic books in the country was done in this one town. In Illinois, and the uh, they, they, did, they did a great job. Uh, they kept the cost down. The comic books were, were everywhere. They they didn't have comic book shops, but they had uh, grocery stores and drug stores that carried them all over the place in, in little spinner racks. And kind of companies like uh, DC Comic Books and Dell Comic Books and Gold Key Comic Books and Archie Comic Books. Uh, were, were all over the place. Every week there was new comic books. So every week the kids would come in and go to the, go to the, uh, the spinner racks in their local drugstore to find out yeah. what was going And uh, it was a great time because uh, the DC uh, in the late 1950s began reviving characters and coming out with titles like uh, Superman's pal Jimmy Olsen and Lo the Lois Lane comic books. So oh, wow. It wasn't just Superman and Batman anymore. Uh, they, they were really exp they're experimenting with expanding on the characters. And uh, it got even more exciting when they came up with the Justice League of America and began reviving old characters like Green Lantern and The Flash into a new versions of those characters. And uh, we were really excited because they, they were, these comic books involving superheroes becoming more and more prevalent. Right. And then on the East Coast, there was a group called Man Magazine Management Company. And they were doing monster comics, giant monsters. And uh, they, they were goofy, and uh, they, were a lot, they were a lot of fun for kids because we like giant monsters. But yeah. uh, in, 19, in 1960, at the end of 1961, they came out with their first superhero title called Fantastic Four. 
and they changed the brand from magazine management to Marvel comic books. These are headed by Stan Lee. He's trying to do run direct competition against DC, DC comic books by coming out with a whole new line of superheroes as fast as he could. So he came out with uh, Fantastic Four, and he came out with Thor, the Mighty Thor, then the Invincible yeah. Man, and uh, more and more character. Iron Man came out, uh, teams with um, title with uh, who was it? Uh, it wasn't Captain America. It was some, uh, but anyway, the more titles began coming out. Right. And, uh, they, they grabbed us because the style of book was so different than the DC style, which was so pristine and so, uh, uh, I would say, um, tepid, dull almost, because the storylines were so uh, hackneyed, like, you know, Superman becomes a Toreador or something like that. It, it was just weird stuff for the character to do. It had nothing to do with fighting crime. It had nothing to do with saving the world. It was just a character day-to-day life. Whereas Marvel had, you know, adventure. They had suspense. They had uh, death-dealing uh, villains. And uh, things became, were, were dramatic. And the characters had problems. They just, they weren't the usual uh, perfect heroes anymore. They were, they had, Spider-Man was a teenager with, who had problems. So it's a, um, it was a real different version of comic books. And so you had that uh, choice now. Fans could either like DC comic books and stick with Batman, Superman, and Wonder Woman, or they could go over to this new company that's experimenting with Spider-Man and Doctor Strange and later Nick Fury, Agent of S.H.I.E.L.D. All these things were coming out in the 60s. And these companies were colliding uh, again and again uh, over who was making the more uh, sales per month. And it was, it was a very interesting time to be a comic book collector because you really had to make some uh, choices and boiled down to which company you like better, Marvel or DC. True. So and well, lived- um, <laughs> that, was, that was quite a crazy time for them That's to a- be button heads and working that hard to yeah. re- recreate their characters. How did you, how did you come about with Dynamo Joe? Well, it was in the 1970s when I was going to a Japanese uh, grocery store in the city. And uh, I noticed that they had posters on a wall for a TV show that was being run on a, on a a UHF channel, one of the specialty channels that had to, had to have a special antenna to pick it up. But they were running Japanese shows that were subtitled. And one was a cartoon show featuring a giant robot. And it blew my mind. Because I remember Astro Boy and Gigantor and Speed Racer, but this was something totally different. Yeah. And it was a, co- a show called Brave Rideen. It's a, a gigantic robot. Uh, it looked like almost, almost Egyptian. But it was gorgeous. And it was huge and I, I managed to see an episode of the show, and it simply uh, transformed me because after after years of the Flintstones and Scooby Doo and uh, yeah. things like that, this was a revelation because it was nothing like American shows. It had violence, it had explosions, and it had you know threatening dangers of, of cosmic scale. And you just didn't put that into a cartoon in America. You just didn't do that. No. Uh, and and who had a giant? Nobody had a giant. Pretty much. Uh, Frankenstein Jr. was probably the biggest I had from Panda Bear Air. But um, I, I was stunned, and uh, I, I bought whatever uh, model kits and figurines and posters and things. And manga, what they had is Japanese comics called manga. And I bought them that had the characters in those in, the, in their books, which are like little telephone books, but they're made of cheap paper. They don't have colored p- images like four-color comics, but they had the colored inks. So uh, one page would be purple, and the next page would have black ink, and another page would have uh, a dark brown or something. So the, character, the, the book is kept lively in terms of uh, its presentation, but it, feel, it was filled with wild characters like giant robots and uh, magical knights and all kinds of things that were just not done in American comic books because they were so over the top of how they were presented. 
Now, they're in Japanese, and you could follow along just by looking at the artwork. And even though I couldn't read Japanese, I could uh, understand the art, artwork, and it was really, really attractive. It had The panels were exploded. They weren't just the usual six-panel uh, comic book page you always see in American comic books, but they were able to design characters that were exploding out of the panels and into another panel, and it was really, really kinetic energy. And it was a revelation to see that. And I wanted to do something like that myself. I wanted to have a giant robot character of my own. And uh, in fact, I came up with like half a dozen. <laughs> you and, did, really? Oh, yeah. Just, just I, trying different ones to see what, I because the character in your mind of I what was, your personality was, of your robot does that come into what you create? All right, so the personality that you feel your robot has, is that where you inspire yourself to draw the, the actual robot from what you feel their character would be like? Oh, it was, it was a design exercise. There, there were certain parameters in terms of how the, what the proportions of the body should be and uh, the, the, what, was, what would, made a good villain robot and what made a good hero robot. Things like that. It was it was a learning process. But the more books, more manga I saw, and the more anime I saw, it was called Japanimation back then. It, anime came later. But I was able to just soak it up like a sponge. I just really, really liked it more than more than comic books done in America, more than comic books coming out of Europe. The the Japanese influence hit me right in, right in the head, in the heart, and to, and it was uh, exciting. It was a very exciting time. And I got uh, enough uh, ideas that I had a, a big file of, of ideas for different stories, different characters. And so if I had the opportunity of pulling one out and actually doing them for a comic book publisher, I was ready. Wow, that's incredible. And what an awesome start to creating Dynamo Joe because you came up with an amazing just out of this world, amazing, just brilliant colors. The the character in itself is so well done. I can understand why you had to draw a bunch of them to create the perfect one. Mm -hmm. It's a, it's pretty amazing. Uh, I now when you myself. you must be so inspired. That's how you continue to keep pushing with Dynamo Joe. Because how many how many different books did you put out under that one title of that character? I put out uh, well, there's 15 issues and a couple crossovers with other books like Grimjack for First Comics. Um, the book would have gone longer, except that they changed uh, from the four color process to a uh, laser printing process, which had much more expensive paper and a much more uh, involved uh, printing processing using laser. And that like more than doubled the price of the book. And th these books were in the, in the dollar 50 bracket already. So doubling that, you know, you, you, you have $3. And for most comic book fans, if you double the price of the comic books, they, they can only get so many comic books. They have to settle for some and, and drop other titles. That's true. So uh, that, what happened to me is that a Dynamo Joe comic leveled off in sales. It didn't d go down. It just leveled off. And as far as first comics was concerned, that was enough to cancel the book. No. Well, that's too bad because Dynamo Joe should actually be a living character. Well, uh, that, the first comics would agree with you now. They've been trying to get me back to uh, revive the character under their title, uh, under their banner again, but I won't do it. Mostly because they didn't listen to me at all when I was there before. <laughs> he, I, he, is, he is your baby, so yeah, well, you can do whatever you want I was with him. Aware of the big uh, licensing explosion in Japan, how these comic books and anime characters on, on TV using giant robots, they had toy lines and they had books and they had model kits and they had T-shirts and posters and all kinds of things that the fans in Japan were eating up, you know, by huge amounts, it was a it was a huge industry in Japan, and I tried to point this out to my bosses that we could you know do a toy to make a poster or whatever and yeah. go up and they said you're just a comic book artist you don't know anything. Oh. 
And, they and just, you saw all of that exploding over there. And you're telling these guys, look, this is how we can capitalize on this. No, they did not check on what yeah. I said. They just didn't bother. No, no. And, and that's too bad because you was a visionary. I, I was afraid I'm ahead of my time in that respect. Um, it, it's a curse. <laughs> and <laughs> and, and they didn't realize that till later on down the road when other people might have picked up that same so, idea and said, hey, so, we'll sell a T-shirt here and there. I wouldn't trust them as far as I could throw them. <laughs> <laughs> and that's true. Uh, not with Dynamo Joe. He probably crushed them. Um. Did you uh, ever decide to bring Dynamo Joe back to life as far as more comics or something uh, on this level of this time frame? There's about a period of 20 years where I was under that they owned the rights to Dynamo Joe, at least half the rights, so that I would need their permission to do anything. And since I didn't want to work with them and they wouldn't let me do it on my own, I figured that was the end of it until I uh, I, I found a uh, legal firm that would help artists, and they did an investigation about the rights to Dynamo Joe, and they found out that First Comics does not have the rights to Dynamo Joe. Ooh. And they, they were they were misrepresenting themselves. And so they made sure that uh, my application for copyright was went through uh, unmolested, and uh, they said if I, I get any trouble from First Comics, they will be happy to represent me in court. Because uh, First Comics does not have a leg to stand on legally and saying, insisting that they own Dynamo Joe. They do not. He's yours. Yeah. And so now. Well, you're the father. My friend Charles here and I are working on getting Dynamo Joe back. Charles, that would be brilliant, wouldn't it? So it's in the works. I think it, I think it would be brilliant. I think it's a, I think it's perfect timing because. He's only been sleeping 20 years under a tree, but we can wake him right back up. Hmm. Charles says he has something to add to this uh, point. Yeah, yeah. One thing very interesting uh, that yeah. most people don't know with copyright law is um, when you do work for a company and that company goes out of business, the rights actually revert back to the original artists or creators. That's why right now you have some people suing Disney for copyright over Iron Man and some of the others because when Marvel did go bankrupt, which they did, and they reorganized and became a new company called Marvel, they actually, the copyright actually went back to those original people. And now we're going to see what games Disney will pull, but basically that's what, uh, uh, that's why Doug was free with uh, his rights. Yeah, in order for Marvel to keep those characters, they're going to have to pay. The, uh, the heirs of the, of the estates of uh, various artists like yeah. Steve Joe and Jack Kirby to keep those characters. Right. And the same with you, Charles, because you you was part of the creation of uh, The Little Mermaid. So how does that, I mean, Philo that Barnhart. Would, Philo Barnhart. Oh, Philo. I'm sorry. We had Philo on last time. Um, but like, wouldn't that work? That would work in Philo's behalf too at this point. Possibly. Well, it's well, it's just really interesting, guys, you know? On bankrupt, so. Yeah, this, is just, yeah. this is just, yeah, this is just really interesting that, that, but I think it's great that the artists get their original a piece because they're the ones who created it. They're the ones who set how many hours creating one idea. Yeah. Well, in my and case, then they, you know, one of the reasons I was able to get Dynamo Joe secured is the fact that I had Dynamo Joe as an idea before I worked at First Comics. I mentioned I was coming up with those ideas for different giant robots. Dynamo yeah. Joe one of them. Well, hang on one, th- one second, Doug. We're going to take a really quick break, and we'll come right back, and we'll right. continue talking with Mr. Doug Rice. We're just going to take a real quick break right now. Welcome back to the show, everybody, and this is Debbie Perkins with Hollywood Red Carpet Radio. And I'm here talking with Doug Rice and Charles Morset. And this has been such a great hour. Half, well, so far, we're only halfway through. But what a great time with you guys. Uh, learning so much about the comic world that you come from. And you are the original comic book people. You're the people that everybody should look up to in inspiration. Now, Doug, 
Who inspired you in the artistic world besides Charles? (laughs) I have to show that in there because Charles, you're right there. Okay. uh, People who influenced me in terms of inspiration. I have to say, first of all, Walt Disney and all the um, work that his uh, studio has done uh, for, for kids back in the 1950s was phenomenal. Uh, their standard of cartooning and animation and even in comic books was very, very high. They had really high standards. And uh, I, I would always look, look at their comic books more than anybody else's because it just was better art. And it was, it was very inspiring. And uh, they had a show called the Mickey Mouse Club back in the 1950s, a black and white show for kids in the afternoon after school. And they had an artist on there uh, who wore the uh, musketeers, big fat guy, who would come in and uh, set up a big easel with paper, and he would have a, a like a black marker, and he would start drawing something right away. Just sit down and start drawing, 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 uh, comic book character, uh, Disney characters like Mickey Mouse and Donald Duck and all these guys. And it was done live, you know, just in real time, right in front of you. And I had never seen that before. I had seen all the results of it, but I'd never seen anybody actually draw a comic book or a cartoon character before. And it was, it was mind numbing. I realized that's what I wanted to do with my life. From that moment on, I knew I wanted to be like that guy with that easel and that chalk uh, uh, marker. And it was a uh, remarkable revelation to a young boy. And I was like, you know, eight years old. <laughs> so wow. it was uh, something that I, I always wanted to, it's one of the reasons I, I scribbled in the margins of my homework at school uh, for, for years after that is because I now had something to do with my hands that I wanted to do. Draw. Learn how to draw. And I am self-taught. That's when I never went to art school. I never did, took an art class. I was simply uh, driven to uh, learn how to draw. And I would, for a while there, I was doing temporary employment uh, after college, uh, after the service, and then after college to uh, figure out, uh, I went to commercial art studios as a gopher, you know, almost uh, as an intern, and looked over the shoulders of everybody working in that in that studio and find out what they were doing and how they were doing it, and they would show me. So I picked up some basic skills that way, and I was able to go home every night and, and start doing comic books on my own, and some of them were published in uh, what they call fanzines back then, uh, very short uh, black and white publications that were uh, published usually uh, cheaply, but they were sold at the little comic book shows that were run every month at the YMCA in town. And uh, we got to meet other artists and have uh, our work show our work, and they, they would be eagerly be publication. Uh, publication was immediate almost, almost because uh, it, some of us were better than others. But we always learned from each other. And uh, after a while, one of those publications, one of those fanzines, was seen by some local professionals. And that's how I got my first job at uh, First Comics, doing uh, being on the art staff. And that led to my being able to show them my Dynamo Joe idea and getting it published. That's wild. And how it's almost like it rolled. One little thing started, and then it just kept going and kept going and get bigger and bigger. How that's did you no- keep yourself how do you keep yourself centered? Because you've done some really great work for some really big companies. And I think my head would blow up if I were you. Um, but you've done some really beautiful works. Thank you've you. worked now you've done um and now correct me if I'm wrong on anything here. I have uh Star Blazers. Star Blazers, uh-huh. the adaptation of the one of the animated shows from Japan, um, a space battleship Yamato. So yeah, I did an adaptation of a Japanese show. That's amazing. Yeah, and, and it shows that you've learned so much from that show that you were watching. It's kind of rolled over into some style that you have. Yeah, uh, the uh, I found that I don't have a particular single style. I can do the Marvel superhero method. I can do the Disney squash and stretch cartoon method. I can do the manga method from Japan. Uh, this this is uh, the kind of thing that uh, is an artist can be very, very flexible about what kind of jobs he's available for. 
because they know I can do pretty much anything they throw at me. And How that's about what, flexible? How about and, Plastic uh, Man? Now, uh, Plastic Man, is that one of yours? Yeah, that's something I worked on, yes. It was based on the artwork of Jack Cole. Uh, we were very faithful to his style from the 1940s of a, the first rubbery superhero. And uh, oh, it was a great... Awesome. We loved that strip, working on it. It was a, a great humor superhero strip, and uh, we were trying to be as faithful as we could to it because we loved it. So that comes way before all these recent things with the stretch. Remember Stretch Armstrong? It used to be a doll that kids would get. Mm-hmm. It would probably be like in the He's 70s. Man, Remember and- that doll? That's what, that's like an idea that would have sprung off something like the plastic man. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. And they're, they're, uh, DC had a character called the Elongated Man, and uh, Marvel came up with Mr. Fantastic and the Fantastic Four. All these characters had the same stretch powers. Yep. And then it all starts way back with you. Isn't that something? Well, I, the- me, this is Jack Cole's work from the 1940s. I, I, I yeah. did a uh, revival of the character for a miniseries at DC. I worked on that with Phil Folio and Hilary Barta. Oh, wow. Now, um, what about Toxic Avenger? Everybody knows that. Toxic, Toxic Avenger. Avenger. Was, right, uh, Marvel needed, uh, they had a Toxic Avenger book, so they, they, they wanted some extra stories in it. And so uh, Joe Staten, who was my old boss at First Comics, he gave me my first job at First Comics, uh, I was working on the artwork for a particular issue. And so Hillary Barta, who I worked on with Plastic Man, and I, would get together and we would do... Uh, layouts and uh, write the script for it because we were doing we were good at, good at the humor aspect which has which is uh, Doxic Avenger has uh, very much of we like to we like doing the funny books it does sound you have such a great sense of humor too because I mean you were involved with Roger Rabbit Tales of the Mutant Ninja Turtles mm. um, and that's really cool because they're so different, but yet so well done. And the colors, Roger Rabbit's colors were just brilliant and they're just eye popping. Like you were talking about, you know, physical presence. That comes to mind with Roger Rabbit. When I was given the Roger Rabbit uh, eight page assignments for a whole year, um, I was uh, very much inspired by the movie, the original movie, right, Who Framed Roger Rabbit. And the shorts that came out afterwards, which were done by Richard Williams, a brilliant animator. And uh, using his model sheets and everything, I was able to do layouts for every story I did. So I wasn't just writing it. I was also doing basic poses and things for the characters, the expressions, the gestures, and the very cartoon style that uh, is demanded for a character. And it was a lot of fun. It was very liberating to get away from superheroes and, <laughs> and giant robots for a while. Now you, uh, you Doug won an Emmy. Yes, um, as I said, there uh, the ability to jump styles from a superhero style to a Japanese style to the squash and stretch style of cartooning uh, was something that uh, br- caught the attention of some people that uh, knew me, and they recommended me for assignment at a, a new sh- animation studio that was opening in the south suburbs of Chicago, a place called Star Tunes. And they were uh, what was called a pickup studio, very small, uh, like under 20 employees, but it had uh, the job of, of taking animation work from Hollywood and uh, say that Warner Brothers would have uh, 26 episodes of a given show, and they would give us six episodes of the show to do on our own so that they could work easily on, on the remaining 20, make their schedule easier to, to meet. And we were able to spend a lot of time with these scripts to develop the entire show from script to finished film in our shop using the digital method. And uh, I, I learned a lot that way. But I was drawing it on paper and giving giving it to uh, the other teams to scan and paint and that kind of thing. But I did the background layouts and I did uh, storyboards, which are essentially animated comic books. 
It's a lot of work. That's a lot of work. Yes, it is. I've never drawn so much in my life, and I never had so much fun. I, I hope so, because you love it, and that's what made it probably the time go uh, a little bit faster. But still, it's how do you feel like when you have completed a project and you have to kind of give the baby up? Oh, well, uh, I did, uh, in, in terms of animation... Um, it's it's a pleasure to turn it in and get the work approved because you know that the people are going to do the follow-up work and doing the actual animation and color and painting and putting it all together uh, are going to do a great job because they're, they're a much higher caliber of professional than I was because I was dragging off the street and I had no idea how to do animation uh, professionally. I was not instructed in that. I had never gone to school for that. They had to show me. And I, fortunately, I, I was enough, enough of a cartoon person, I was able to pick it up and run with it. I did the layout, background layout designs, and I did the uh, storyboards. And then they taught me how to do in-betweening and cleanups and animation. So I was always busy doing something at the shop. And the work we did was such that uh, our episodes were, our six episodes per year was, was, uh, were so clean and so, so slick that uh, they were used for the Emmy consideration. So we helped the wow. uh, get the Emmy Awards for uh, Steven Spielberg Presents Animaniacs. And um, the work uh, I was doing in the shop, even though I was in Chicago and they were out in Hollywood, uh, the stuff I was doing apparently they felt was worthy of note. And so they added my name to the list of Emmy recipients. And so I got a daytime Emmy uh, certificate for my work on... Picking the brain, picking the brain, and animaniacs. Isn't that amazing? Uh, you, I mean, it was amazing. I mean, it, it must have felt really, really good that they acknowledge you because there's so many artists in the field uh, that you work in throughout mm -hmm. the, throughout history, and it's like the little guy gets noticed finally. You know, giving somebody an award that they deserve it. They really, really deserve it. And well, I think I that's fantastic. That. And uh, to give you some idea what the reward, what the moment meant to me, when my boss came in there and handed me my Emmy certificate and a letter of congratulations from the head of Warner Brothers Animation, I took a deep breath and I called my mother. <laughs> and my mother was a great believer in a work ethic. And she had always written me off as being the lost sheep in the family because I was I didn't really have a real job. I was doing artwork. You were doing artwork. <laughs> Isn't that like that's historical? I get busy for a while, all of a sudden the work would disappear, and she would go, "Oh no, what happened now?" And, uh, and then I said, uh, "Mom, um, can you answer a question for me?" She says, "What?" I said, "Do you know anybody who's ever won uh, an Emmy award?" Anybody, your family or anybody? And she said, no, I, I don't think so. And I said, eh, wrong. Uh, <laughs> and what did she say for that? Son, everything I did was fine. <laughs> that must have made her day because now she could go around and tell all her girlfriends it, it that made her, her son it made, was it made, <laughs> it made the birth yeah. was worth it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, isn't that funny though? You yeah. didn't admit, it, but does your brother have an Emmy? Pardon? Your brother doesn't have an Emmy. No, my brother doesn't have Emmy. My brother well, doesn't. He doesn't. <laughs> in the international <laughs> database. <laughs> but you know what? He doesn't have an Emmy, and an Emmy is just as good as any da database. Um, yeah. Now you did, you did a movie called Little Dogs on the Prairie. It was a series, uh, series of videos. Uh, I think it was a series of six videos. A little so cool. Not a movie. Oh, okay. All right. And I have Hysteria. Right. That's another Warner Brothers series. And there's another one called Road Rovers. Road Rovers. Yep. That's That was one of the ones I had on my list, too. Those are both. Those two are from uh, Warner Brothers. After we did uh, Animaniacs, uh, when this show oh, closed, so they all kind of rolled all together. It's like 
you must have been going out of your mind with all these different cartoons and having to come up with all these millions of ideas. I mean, you yeah. can't even imagine what it you must have been thinking at the time. I, I really took to it, though. It was uh, in terms of work, of all the kind of works, work I had, and I've been in the Air Force, I've been uh, doing temporary employment in a lot of places, and I'd done uh, comic books for Marvel and DC and, and first comic books. And uh, with first with Star Tunes, uh, the job was better than sex. <laughs> <laughs> um, wait, uh, who are you telling that to? <laughs> it was so uh, Charles, so, I heard you. You say you were oh, saying. I'm sorry, honey. I'm sorry. I was. I heard Charles in the background laugh after you said that. It was. It was very funny. I mean, it's true. It's true. It was that good of a job. That's amazing. That's because, amazing. Let me tell you one reason why is that you you can't yeah. Hollywood money. You can't beat it. No. Uh, the way it was set up, uh, we, we, we were working out of Chicago, out of Chicago suburb, and we were still getting the same pay rate as Hollywood. And we had a system where you have a budget and a time limit for what, whatever part of the animation you're doing. In my, in my case, I was doing layouts and storyboards mostly. And anytime I would go through that, I did it very fast and I did it very fast because I had worked in comic books and in comic books, if you don't work fast, you don't eat. Yeah. Because you, you get paid by the page. Yeah. So you have to do as many pages as you can per day or you don't pay the rent, you don't eat and all that kind of thing. So you learn tricks, you learn uh, shortcuts, you learn anything you can to get the job done fast. And right because it has to be accepted. So it's not just to be done right. Uh, you have to, you have to be accepted uh, by the editor and approved. So if you use drawing crap, you're not going to get any more work. So uh, I learned all the things I learned in comic books. I was able to apply to the layout work I was doing, and consequently, I was faster than anybody in in the studio in terms of drawing layouts, backgrounds for the, for the uh, each cartoon that we did. And all the other artists could draw very, very well, but for every background they could do, uh, I could do three or four. Wow. And uh, that's why they gave me the layout department. <laughs> I was there by myself. And you're just so educated, and you just know what you're doing. Um, can I let everybody know that you are a professor in, in, in the, let's see, in, the co in a college? Hold on. Um, where did I have that? It's in Chicago. I know that. Columbia College of the Arts in Chicago, yes. Yes, Columbia College. There it is. I finally find it. Um, that's wonderful. So you get to share what you've learned teaching classes with people. Mm -hmm. Yes. They, uh, the the, the, unit, the uh, college goes out of its way to hire uh, professionals who have retired or whatever, and uh, they have... Uh, not just professionals, but acclaimed professionals, ones who are ones of note. And in wow. my case, uh, the very fact that I was, uh, had, had gotten the Emmy Award uh, was shared by the guy who was running the animation department at Columbia at the time, uh, who also worked at Startons with me. And so he knew who I was and knew that I was not working regularly, and he offered me a chance to do some lectures on the history of Japanese animation and apparently that went over well enough that they said they offered me a chance to do to design some uh, traditional animation courses involving um, things like backgrounds and layouts that was I uh, specialized in. And uh, the so fact that I had the, uh, the image certificate from uh, Warner Brothers was like a doctorate. Wow. Now, you sell your art too, don't you? You'd be a pro. Some huh? of you some art. You sell art, right? Uh, I, I've sold most of my collection years ago because <laughs> I was hungry and yeah. needed to eat. <laughs> oh, well. Sure. But, but I, 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 I'm happy to do artwork at conventions and things like that. I still enjoy yeah. that. And you have a convention coming up, right? We have a convention coming up. No, not 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 you. I, I do. Charles has a convention. Oh, Charles, Charles where are you going to be? What convention is that? Oh, it's going to be at DeadCon this weekend in Fort 
Wayne, Indiana, with all the creepy people. So if you're out that way, stop by Charles's table and just say yeah. hi. And uh, you know, and on occasion, Doug does do uh, commissions. Uh, but uh, you know, I'm he's kind of busy with class right yeah, now. Yeah, you're you're very busy with class. You know, when class is not in session, then that's when he likes to do commissions. That's but, excellent. Yeah. <laughs> And it's and it's a rare thing to get a get a, a piece of your artwork. So, I mean, anybody's lucky enough to have a piece of your artwork hanging on their wall. I mean, that's a masterpiece in itself. Well, I'm being told that some of my artwork is still floating around the art sellers uh, on the internet. So, I think I found a few of them. You might be able to find some. Yeah, I found some, but they want a lot of money for your work. Do they really? <laughs> Hey, that's your house. Well, I'm sorry. Say that again. So uh, all you have to do is sell your house. Yeah. So, yeah well, it's, <laughs> it's a bit expensive. But then again, I mean, maybe they paid a lot for it at one point before. Who knows? Who knows? But I think that's really fantastic that you're helping students learn your style. Um. Can you tell me a little bit about the the soft cover or and hard cover volume of a uh, squadron? A squadron. Yes. There was a period of time uh, in the uh, let's see about after Star Tunes uh, collapsed uh, and uh, we were all given the boot because of Warner Brothers had a change in management. And uh, all the people we were working with were gone, and all the people that came in uh, had their own crew, and they had no use for us, and they decided not to pay their bill. So there was no money to float to keep the company going, so we had to give up and disband. Uh, I still stayed in the same town where Star Tunes is, because I'm, I'm really comfortable here. <laughs> it's a beautiful place. Yeah. and yeah. Uh, But I, I needed something to keep myself busy. And uh, one of the first things I did, I, I decided to pull out another idea I had, which was to, to write an adventure novel, maybe do a graphic novel. And uh, I, I decided that I couldn't do a graphic novel uh, without, a, without it being published uh, and getting some advance on it, because by page 17 of a graphic novel, I would have starved to death. <laughs> so I was out. But I decided to do a regular novel and just write it and write it in bits and pieces and develop it along the way, and uh, that's what I started doing. And it's a, a what they call it, <coughs> a, a pulp adventure novel, uh, which is uh, set in the 1930s. It's a kind of a period where you find Doc Savage or The Shadow, but it's uh, on a big scientific uh, science fiction scale that is worldwide. It's kind of an air adventure. And I got this ca uh, character called Captain Jack Tolstoy, Who's uh, trying to find out what happened to the other half of the world? Because during the world, during World War One, uh, half of the Earth was uh, wiped out by a uh, a space catastrophe of some kind. Nobody knows what, but the east the eastern hemisphere was severely hit, wiping out whole cultures. And in the West, while while they, they survived relatively intact, uh, they have been out of communication with the the other half of the world. This is back in the nineteen twenties and thirties. Well, they didn't have easy communication uh, with, the, with the other side of the world. Uh, the, the, the things like the telephone cables were gone. Uh, the uh, use of, of ships was restricted because the seafloor kind of raised up uh, reefs and things that were now uncharted, and they would sink ships. And they couldn't fly because the planes were too flimsy. And it wasn't until the 1930s that this, these adventurers, Jack Tolstoy and his, and his pilot, uh, Vera Beaumont, uh, decided to uh, take the uh, mandate from the President of the United States to make contact with the, with the Eastern Hemisphere and find out what the heck happened to them and try to uh, make, make, it, uh, make this connection permanent so they could get, uh, help, uh, help out if, in any way they could. Anyway, there's no idea, they have no idea what's waiting for them over there. And it turns out that World War II has started, but it's a very different kind of war. Wow. 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 You know, we're running out of time, but 
I thought this was so amazing having you on tonight, having you talk about these really great stories. Thank you, Charles, so much for all the wonderful things you've been doing to help with the shows. And uh, I just want to thank you, Doug, so much for coming on and sharing mm-hmm. your wonderful journey. It has been my pleasure. Thank you very much for having me. Mark, did you want to say anything? No, but Teresa says hi. And her son's been listening, too, and um, his name's Lucas, and they've been going gaga over uh, the talk about comics, and they're really into comics, too. (laughs) See? See? I think that comics will be around forever. Yes, I think so, too. Uh, No matter what happens to the big companies and how they try to control things, the comic medium is very much uh, becoming something that uh, that even small groups of people can cre- keep going and exchanging over the uh, internet or whatever. It's uh, it's not going to die. It, it's not. And going with to die. that last wonderful words from Mr. Doug Rice, I want to thank everybody for listening. Thank you, Doug. Thank you, Charles, and thank you, Mark. Have a good night, everybody. We'll see you next week. Thank you, and good night too.